So, it's been a year since we've gotten the conclusion of the current Xenoblade trilogy, and while the future Redeem DLC left many options for how the series can proceed, overall, I think I've finally had enough time to mull over my thoughts and decide how I feel about this game. When it comes to my favorite JRPGs, gameplay is the most important part for me, and 3 delivered on that front with all the chaotic frenzy that having 7 active party members brings, but Xenoblade has emerged as a masterclass among the JRPG genre thanks to its consistent quality in gameplay, storytelling, and world building. Unfortunately for 3, the setting of Ionios is fairly empty when compared to the Bionis, Mekonis, and all the Titans of All Rest, as that's kinda the whole point with the game's main message. Without the mystery of the world to push the player along, the burden of holding the player's interest falls onto the playable cast. And that's what makes this cast specifically stand out so much more. They had to bet it all on this party, and honestly, that play paid off in spades as 3's cast is easily the best in the series, and while I do love the parties of 1 and 2, I say the dynamic is even better than even the one of the original cast, which is pretty damn good if you remember that game. So, how does this video break down? Well, let's just get this out of the way, as every single character in this party is S tier. For the first time, we finally have a Xenoblade party that is comprised solely of top tier, premium S tier characters. So while I might have some criticisms at times for the cast, and I may like other characters more than others among this crew, objectively speaking, the cast is phenomenal. So, as I give my thoughts about these characters, standard rules apply. This is my opinion, blah blah blah, I will spoil the game start to finish, blah blah blah, and this is a first in these videos, as gameplay doesn't mean anything with the cast, as they are all fully customizable, so this video is solely on how much I like their character development. Ionios may be stuck in time, but this video is already past the one year anniversary at the time of recording, so let's just get right into it. While the cast is filled with winners, someone has to be at the bottom of the list, so who am I going to upset the most with my placement? Well, probably everyone because my least favorite character in the cast is Mio. Mio is a strong warrior with a soft side that she tries to hide. Despite her prowess in battle, Mio was assigned as one of her colony's offseers alongside the sweet yet not as strong, at least in the lore, Miyabi. Skip ahead a few years and the duo alongside Senna. Yippee! are sent to Colony Omega where a shit goes boom and Miyabi sacrifices herself to help our female Agnium party members escape. In the present day, Mio has only three months left to live and bears this burden while trying to change the world within her twilight term. So how does she cope with this existential dread? Mio has multiple outbursts of justifiable anxiety and frustration towards Noah, and that had me sympathize with her because of how real it feels. Get used to me saying that throughout the video. A lot. Mio is kinda right though. I probably shouldn't be side questing as much unless I want this episode of 90 Day Fiance to get real depressing at the end. Now, as I was playing through the game, helping some hippies and getting Yuni a girlfriend since she has two hands, the whole time I was wondering, how do they inevitably extend Mio's life? Because I know full well that modern games do not have the balls to kill playable characters like they used to in the good old days. And no, Mwamba doesn't count, that was pretty obvious what was going to happen to him given, you know, marketing. So how did they release the narrative noose they tied around themselves? Deus Ex Machina, that's how! Enter M, the Mobius counterpart of Mio, better known as the real deuterogonist of the story. M wants nothing to do with Mobius as she was reincarnated against her will to do their bidding, so she crafts a master plan to get out. Somehow, in becoming Mobius, M gained possession powers and uses them to swap places with Mio. This gives Mio a chance to fight where M couldn't, and it gives M the freedom she wants, for which death is the only way out. M and Mio are foils to each other, yet I still see them as separate characters, and what M does for Mio is okay, but what Mio does for M is amazing. 
While Mio's doubts and fears didn't really hit me as hard as say Uni or Tyon's internal conflicts, once Chapter 6 dropped and gave me the feature length film on Noah and Mio's backstories, it kinda sorta it's not really them but their past selves, not important point is, while everyone was getting ready to call this loser baby girl, I was finally seeing what everyone saw in Mio, but in M. You know how Mithra is just the more well written and better developed Aegis girl? Well, Pyra has a lot of subtext you have to fill in the gaps for yourself, as she never vocalizes how she feels being a construct made to deal with problems Mithra didn't feel fit to handle, which was all of them. I always liked that aspect of Pyra, which is why I like her more than Mithra, and I think that's why I like M more than Mio. Just think about how it would feel knowing that you were brought back to life against your will only to now serve the entity you were working to stop, all because your boyfriend made the right choice. I mean, went off the rails and wanted to clap your cheeks for eternity. Well, that sounds like paradise for some, it's Mio's worst nightmare, and hearing her finally get a chance to express her innermost thoughts that she's kept reserved for centuries at this point, really resonated with me and made me just appreciate this character. I've spoken to other content creators, artists, cosplayers, and friends who played this game on their own, and from what I've seen, Mio is loved by many, many fans, but there are people I talk to as well who didn't vibe with her as much like I do. So while I can only reflect my own thoughts, I'll leave it to you in the comments to tell me if you're more of an M fan like me, or if you're a Mio fan, and if you're the latter, boy does Nintendo want your money. Overall, I think Mio is a very intricate character who is as strong as she is sweet, but this cast is just so amazing overall that, unlike the other two games, there is no obvious least developed character so to say, and I have plenty of praise for her despite the fact that someone did have to be my least favorite character and it just happened to be Mio. But she deserves happiness and plenty of- Water! Come on, let's go! Yeah! Normally, this type of character is among my favorite for the party, but next we're talking about the tank of Colony 9, Lanz. Lanz is a strong-willed hothead who is heavily guarded, not just on a physical level, but an emotional one as well. Unlike other characters we've seen in the series of this archetype, Lanz isn't as chummy. His brash demeanor makes sense given the war-torn world he's in, which really intrigued me as, even from the trailers, you can hear the turmoil in his voice. I refuse to believe you're him! This behavior is on full display when he meets the Agnian crew, only to become best friends with Senna by morning. Yeah, this inconsistency is a key part of Lance's character, as he tries to be emotionally present for the Kavesi crew, even though he's the one hurting the most from Yorin's death and the scars that event left on him. Now that his deceased childhood friend is actively hunting him down, his trauma is only going to be worse to deal with. So, even though I like Lanz, what puts him lower on the list? Unfortunately, Lanz has one of the weaker arcs in the game as his characterization is tied to Yorin and I get what they were going for with the survivor guilt angle, but I think the conclusion of the arc didn't have the best execution. Don't get me wrong, when Lanz starts brooding, I like seeing him be introspective as he gets aggressive and is confused as that's a very natural reaction for a person to have, so I like seeing that human side of him from a Machina party member of all characters. I also love seeing how he tried to use his experiences to relate to the other party members as that's how he bonds with Senna. But the resolution to his arc doesn't land because having it end with Yorin's second death, which is a bit of an issue when it was fully preventable if I'm being honest. What really stopped him from de-linking with D and fighting alongside with the Ouroboros crew? I'm sure most of you probably weren't thinking of that in the middle of the fight like I was, as you were probably too busy worrying about Nia, to which I say, you're a fake fan, we all knew she was fine if you were a real one. But, no. Instead, Yorin gets a cosmic anime goodbye with Lance that is lacking mostly because the moment isn't fully his own, but it gets shared with Noah and Yuni both of whom have their arcs conclude in different ways, with Noah's having to deal with Chris later, but that one's a whole other mess I've already talked about before. Despite his harsh words at the start, underneath that metallic frame is a heart of gold, and I think Lance is a lovable dork who just needs his bestie Senna beside him to keep that aggression in check. Ah! 
Normally, I'm not the biggest fan of simple characters, but when they activate that one neuron in my brain, I fall in love with them. Case in point for the next entry on this list, Senna. Senna is... The girl with the gall. <clears throat> Senna is a strong character despite her slim physique, and is as adorable as she is powerful. And girl is very powerful. I touched upon her backstory briefly, but prior to meeting Mio, Senna was an awkward girl trying to find herself. Mio reached out to her and became her friend, giving her a little more confidence and a goal to strive for. From then on, Mio, Miyabi, and Senna all grew together as friends and then... <laughs> After which, her and Mio run away to Colony Gamma and this is how the story pans out. Now, this is where I would go into the character's arc and growth, but... About that. Shania. 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 Put the gun down. This is the beginning! So, Senna is supposed to have an arc about gaining confidence, and yes, it's great seeing her go absolutely ballistic on the Pharaonis of Colony Lambda, but her powerful actions in the story don't progress her arc. Even as late in the game as infiltrating the prison, Senna hasn't quite reached self-happiness and makes the same statement she made early on, near the end of the game. Now obviously, confidence issues aren't resolved overnight, and I think Senna is a very real representation of someone with said issues. I can relate, girl. However, there is no resolution to Senna's arc or an acknowledgement of progress that doesn't involve Shania. And I've already talked about how much I don't like that in my other video. At least she gets a proper side story from the Sagiri quest, which has her delve into these issues more, and the quests thereafter with Colony Zero were really cute. I will say though, the moment Senna convinced Lance to trigger an Annihilation event did have me genuinely believe for a few seconds that I was gonna lose two party members. And X, shit character you may be, thank you for being a plot device. Overall, Senna is the simplest character in the cast, but I love her cute voice clips and her optimistic energy just gave me so much joy because with how heavy the story gets, a character like Senna really helps you keep going, and that's why I love the girl with the gall. See me in action, Mimi? Sure I did, Senna. You look great. Shulk remains one of the best characters in the series. Rex left fans divided, although I liked him, and Future Redeem did flesh him out more. So, how did Noah bear on this legacy of being a Xenoblade protagonist? Well, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. Noah is the only character in this video who has a gameplay mechanic worth talking about, and no, we do need to talk about this. Both Noah and Mio can eventually equip unique talent arts, and while Dominion Flower is mid as fuck and not worth talking about, unlocking Lucky 7 completely overhauls Noah's gameplay. Noah gets all new arts when unleashing Lucky 7 that let him simultaneously be the ultimate offensive force in the party, while face tanking every single hit with no problem. This is because Lucky 7 comes with the nifty Doom status, guaranteeing that no matter how much aggro Noah takes, they'll never live for more than 60 seconds. But if trivializing 98% of the game's combat wasn't enough for you, if the enemy does live long enough or is immune to the Doom status, Noah can unleash the final Lucky 7, a talent art that lets him perform the full smash combo and is AoE. This power is something equivalent to what Corvin did in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. You know, the final DLC blade added to the game when they just said, fuck it. And considering how broken he was in that game, I can safely say with confidence, they did jack and shit to balance it in 3. Alright, so now that I got that out of my system, how's Noah as a character? Well, let's start at the beginning, as the game's tutorial opens with Noah cutting down two Agnian soldiers and dumping you immediately into a battlefield. After annihilating a colony, Noah somberly plays his flute and sends off the souls of the fallen for both sides of the battle and accidentally causes his gang to miss the ride back home. Again. Not even an hour into the game and our main protagonist is fairly well defined as he's a somber soul who laments the state of the world and while we would assume this is natural, Lands and Uni's victory screams are a stark juxtaposition 
to Noah's empty gaze over the barren wasteland. This is a great way to introduce a new character, but Noah stands out as a unique protagonist of the series for a very obvious reason. If I had a nickel for every time Nintendo made an antagonistic emo boy that the internet was obsessed with named N, I'd have two nickels, but it's really weird that it happened twice. Thanks to Future Redeemed adding context, N is the result of Zed manipulating a Noah who just had to say goodbye to his kid that he just happened to make an orphan in the middle of the woods in the dead of night. Okay, real talk, how the fuck did Gondor manage to survive this and make his way back to the city? He was like three when this happened. Anyways, after seeing this memory, Zed then shows the countless times Noah tried to fight him and failed miserably. Take these truths and then throw in a revived dead wife and yeah, his actions make a lot more sense and thankfully, Future Redeem explained exactly what happened in the city as for some reason, that couldn't be in the base game because and makes a lot of sense as a character. Thankfully, he's not an evil clone who's evil for evil's sake, but he has his own goals and motivations that are identical to our Noah, and you feel sick seeing how vile he can get to achieve them and realizing, holy shit Noah, you are down bad for Mio. Having your main character's deepest, darkest, innermost thoughts be exposed, not from some long-winded monologue, but through the actions of the primary antagonist stopping you, is some next-level writing. Uh, but there are some problems. Was the feature-length film we saw to get enough context to understand and well executed? No. It was clearly rushed, and there really isn't a good reason for it to be sliced into parts and gradually revealed to the player throughout the course of the game as the plot naturally unfolds, but that's just me. The payoff was still magnificent, as it kinda had to be after that long a cutscene, as showing that Noah wasn't the perfect ponytail pretty boy that we thought he was, but revealed that he's a really selfish person at his core. But thanks to off-seeing, he was able to extend his selfishness beyond himself and fight for a future where everyone moves forward. To end on a hot take that can get taken out of context here, Noah is just Rex if they made him baby girl. Do with that what you will, internet. Tyon and Uni, the healer duo of the party that everyone has fallen in love with. It don't matter that Noah and Mio are the main characters because we know who the real best couple in the game is. So as for who we'll cover first... Yes! Uni's the boss! Uni is the Kavesi medic of Colony 9, who stands out among this cast for a couple of reasons. For starters, she swears like a spark and sailor, and this leads to some great one-liners from her. That foul mouth comes from her strong emotions, which can get the better of her sometimes, as we see this most through her interactions with D. Or Dirk. From as early as the party's initial counter with Mobius, Uni was the most frightened of the party for some unknown reason. Later on, Uni finds a past husk of herself and essentially inherits PTSD from a past life where she was a sharpshooter for another colony, only to face her end at Dee's knuckle laser, explaining the panic in their initial encounter. When the party runs into Dee for the second time, Uni hasn't really processed her past memories and is terrified, understandably so. What makes this such a good moment is how Uni doesn't ditch her fear as we see her make rash decisions that put her in danger, but rather than suddenly get over it like any other trashy cliche story would do, she leans into it and utilizes it to motivate her and get the drop on Dirk by exploiting him with it, which is one of the best moments in the game that made me adore her as a character. From this point on in the story, Uni is still hot-headed and loudmouthed, but there's that added sense of maturity that resonates throughout her dialogue from this point onwards, and gradually, she grows to be ready to face off in their final showdown in the Cloud Keep. Well, it's mostly there, except for when she's being the boss and saying more out-of-pocket one-liners like, What about babies? You guys got any babies? Never change, Uni. Never change. All that's left is the cunning tactician originally from Colony Lambda, who wound up in Gamma, Tyon. Ty Ty. On On. No, just Tyon. Seriously, what the hell did Noah name his kid if Gondor is what they ended up going with? Tyon is easily my favorite party member, and while it seems to be between him and Uni for most, let me remind you of this man's backstory as to why he's mine. As I said, Tyon originates from Colony Lambda and was a budding tactician who had everything go wrong. 
His colony wound up ambushed and most of the inhabitants were wiped out in the attack. The Kavesi assassins ultimately push back Tyon's forces and pin him against a river. His mentor Nimue ultimately sacrifices herself to have Tyon escape via sweeping current, but at the cost of inflicting horrific trauma onto him. Despite coming off as cocky and arrogant, and seeming to be the straight man for Mio and Senna, Tyon is deeply insecure because of these past failures. What makes him feel even guiltier is how accepting Isert is of him after this blunder, filling Tyon with even greater remorse. We see this come forth with his initial interactions with the party as he's even more hostile than Lands, but by the end of the story, we all know he's a big softy. Chapter 3 is essentially the Tyon chapter until Yorin shows up, and was such a roller coaster of emotions that had a glorious climax, but the best part was a quieter moment. The scene where we all fell in love with this man was this one. Like I said, practical. Glad it worked. Ah, oh, you noticed. I did. Mine do that too. Huh? I put down my weapon, look around at my companions, and feel relief. Thinking, finally, another day down. Then I think of tomorrow and the tremors are back. Will I see the same faces when I wake? Will I even be around to see them? Huh. Easier with the mark, I suppose. You know when it's coming. But when you're in a scrap... Can you really speak for them, though? For someone nearing the end? Huh? Because I couldn't tell you. All we can possibly do is wonder what it's like. Tyon being the perceptive party member has him catch on to Yuni's anxiety, and he doesn't go for a grandiose message the same way Noah or Mio would, but he shares his own fears with Yuni, and while he flexes his riz, it doesn't change the fact that he faces the same anxieties anyone else would. This moment just humanizes him so much and reminds you that just like the rest of the party, he's got his own demons he's struggling with, and they come into full force later on in the chapter, where he just has to go through so much so quickly, and ends up doing it wonderfully. I was worried that Tyon's arc would stop after chapter 3, and yeah, it kinda does, but you see him continue to grow more gradually and subtly as he starts trusting the party more, grows closer with Yuni, and finally conquers his own insecurities by being the brilliant mind that protects the lives of his closest friends. There's just one small problem with Tyon. There's just one small problem I have with him. He did land so dirty here for no reason! So overall, I think I like this game more now than when I originally beat it, and that's thanks to the passage of time just letting me think over everything I felt in those moments at the end. If I end up being too lazy to make a tier list of the future redeemed characters, which I know I will be as I don't expect this to do numbers, here it is on screen. So that concludes this drawn out saga of me talking about Xenoblade characters. I mean, yeah, I don't have anywhere to go from here. The Klaus saga is concluded. These videos aren't really as popular now as Genshin has rotted your brains and if it hasn't, maybe I'll see you when I do an Arknights video. But if you just watch me overall, I think you'll be seeing me much more sooner than usual as I got something else cooking. In the meantime, I've got a lot of other games to play like Monolith's latest release as I have to see for myself what happens in the end of the kingdom. Or maybe I just build a functional Gundam after 20 hours. We'll see. Before I truly head out though, I'm just gonna leave you with this. Dirk is Mithra's kid, but Takahashi's writing was so apeshit that the whole cast convinced him against keeping that in. Honestly, kinda glad they did. Peace.